Welcome to the Craft to Career Podcast with Elizabeth Chapel, where every week we dive into how you can turn your craft into a successful career. Get ready to have the career you've always dreamed of. Hello, and welcome to episode 88 of the Craft to Career Podcast. This is Elizabeth Chapel of Quilters Candy, and I am the host of the show. This week, I am excited to have an episode that was completely unplanned. There is a group of us who we all went to Utah together earlier this year for like a, a soft launch, if you will, for quilting retreats. And we still kind of keep in touch. And one of the members of the group, Liza Taylor, she asked, hey, would you guys want to meet with Caitlin of Not and Thread? She has some wholesale distribution accounts and she would love to share her experience with that, the pros, you know, of having a wholesale account and answer questions. And even though I have a wholesale account with people already, I was like, yeah, hey, this is what I teach people. Like, I love to learn, so let's do it. It was so good. Within the first few minutes, I was like, wait, pause, Caitlin. I'm sorry. Do you care if we start again and we can record this? And could I use this for the podcast? She was so sweet to roll with it. She's like, yeah, absolutely. Not planned. But I'm telling you, it's that good. Like you are going to learn so much about wholesale accounts and opening up a distribution account. So thank you, Caitlin, for sharing that with us. And then the group of people who we meet together, um, who are also on this call with us, it's Casey Cometti of Wellspring Design, Kelsey of White Rose Designs, Jessica of Quilted Studios, and then, like I mentioned, Liza Taylor of Liza Taylor Handmade. So uh, before we jump in, I would like to read a review from Apple Podcasts, which if you do write a review on Apple Podcasts by December 31st and send me a photo, a screenshot of your review... You are entered to win January, the first month of the Craft a Career Club, absolutely free. And normally this is for alumni only. So this is your chance to join, to test it out, to see what it's like without ever taking one of my courses. And if you are an alumni, then you can just have it for free. But yeah, go ahead and leave a review and I'll go ahead and read a review from Naughty Hoops. Naughty Hoop says, Elizabeth, your vulnerability and openness reminds me that creators, no matter how big or how small, are real people. No matter how overwhelmed I get or how not good enough I feel, it is possible to get through to the other side. I have learned so much from this podcast and your quilt pattern writing course that I am miles ahead of where I was four months ago. Thank you. I love hearing this. I'm so glad that the course and the podcast has helped you. Like, miles ahead from where you were four months ago. That's really exciting. And I'm glad that you like the vulnerability and openness because sometimes I kid you not, I'm like, eh, was that too much? <laughs> should I, <laughs> should I not? So I'm glad to know that you are enjoying that and that it's helping you realize that everyone's human. Like no matter where you are in your business, we are all human. We all have our ups and downs, which speaking of being open and vulnerable, I thought I would share a little something that happened this last week before we dive into the conversation. And if you listened last week on the podcast, I talked about how to emotionally protect yourself. And then ironically enough, I had an opportunity to put what I said in practice and I didn't like it. Sometimes I'm like, da, no, I learned this. I don't want to do it again. But, um, and I realized that people who aren't experiencing it, like maybe you'll hear what I'm saying and you're like, that's not that big of a deal. But it was to me at that time, you know, and probably for you with your business, when things happen, it feels like a really big deal. So it felt like a big deal to me. So what happened? I was getting ready to send an email out to all of my alumni who've ever taken one of my quilt pattern writing courses or craft to career course. And this was to share about a retreat that Liza Taylor and I are hosting in Utah in September. So I wanted to, I, normally I use Flowdesk and I, I'm very comfortable and familiar with Flowdesk and how to select different audiences and all of that. So Kajabi, I'm not as familiar. So I went in and I just thought it would be slick because it can easily segment all of the past alumni. That's where I host my courses. So I was like, oh, it'll be really easy. So I went in, I selected just people who are customers of these products, wrote the email, sent it out. As soon as I hit send, I could see it was going to 50,000 people. So it was being sent out to my entire 
email list, not just my alumni. And in Flowdesk, once you hit send, it gives you like a minute of grace window period time where you can unsend or cancel. Not so with Kajabi. I was like, wait, what? No, 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 no. But all I could do was sit there and watch and it would have like, now sent to 10,000, now sent to 20, 30. I mean, and it took a few minutes. It was just killing me. I'm like, this is terrible. I'm just sitting here knowing that people are getting this email who are not alumni. And with an email list, you want to treat them so good, you know, like being on someone's email list, it's very easy to unsubscribe. So I really try not to do things that are going to tick people off, you know, one of which is not sending an alumni only event thing to people who are not alumni. So I sat back and I was like, let's just leave this alone. And I reached out to um, an employee of mine and was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this happened. Ugh, I feel sick about it. She was like, well, maybe send an apology. I was like, no, nah, I don't want to bring more attention to it. Let's just leave it be. Because I've gotten those emails where it's like, sent the wrong link. I'm like, Ugh. I like, I noticed that more than I noticed the initial email. So I was like, let's just leave it. So then an email came in from one person and I was checking, refreshing, like, oh, let's see how this plays out. So I refresh, refresh, refresh. One email comes in. I'm confused. I'm not an alumni. Why did I get this kind of a thing? I was like, oh, it's not terrible. You know, I kind of explained to her. Then a few minutes later, I get an email that's like, why on earth would you send this to people who aren't alumni? That's so tacky. And I was like, okay, shoot. It is. As and I was watching and refreshing the unsubscribe rate. It was definitely higher than normal. So my heart's beating. I'm like, oh gosh, oh no. Uh, so I decided let's just send an apology email. I would rather have that out there than not. The people who already unsubscribed will never see the apology email, but at least I'll send it to those who, who haven't, you know? And, and I, pr I knew that people would probably unsubscribe again from getting yet another email. So back to back, but oh, well, I'd rather have that out there. So I sent the apology email and I was literally in tears by the kindness that I received. So the only negative emails I ever got were those two. The kind emails that I got in return are over 100 and the kindness knocked my socks off. Like, in fact, I even got a couple DMs and I'll read this DM to you. Hi, Elizabeth. I just saw your apology email. Please don't worry. We've all had an email oops at some point. I've had plenty. So people need to give you grace. You're one of the most kind, generous business owners out there and deserve that in return. Also, the email subject says alumni only event, which states the audience right off the bat. Anyway, please do not be hard on yourself. Your apology email was so heartfelt and real and your loyal audience and ideal customers should definitely relate. I sent a little treat to your inbox to brighten your day just a bit. I think there might be a crumble fairly close to your office. I hope you like cookies. Take care and have a wonderful Christmas. Can I just say how much like the kindness that was extended to me far surpassed the tacky email? someone sending me a gift card to crumble. I mean, I feel like it's really motivated me to up my game of kindness to others. I, the, it, it meant so much to me. I just can't even begin to tell you, but it, it renewed my faith in humanity. I was like, oh my goodness, people are so good and so nice and forgiving and understanding. And then, so I had the two not as fun emails but then after I sent the apology email, there was one email where they responded and said, please take me off of your list immediately. And I, it didn't bother me at all. I was like, absolutely, because that's not my ideal person. My ideal people are the ones who are being so good and so kind. And so if we just keep being ourselves and showing up in an honest way, we will attract our ideal customer and the people that we want to be surrounded with. And it might look different for each person, but for me my people are in my inbox sending me those kind emails. My only fear now is responding to each of them individually. But um, yeah, so practicing some emotional resilience there and and really sitting with that uncomfortableness of like, wow, let's remember this isn't the end of the world, but it felt like it there for a few minutes, which I realize might sound silly, but it really did feel quite terrible. But things have a way of working out. So with that said, let's jump in and let me introduce you to Caitlin of Knot and Thread. Is that okay? Can we record this? Yeah, sure. 
Is that okay? Because because I think it's really great for people to know how important it is to like earn money that you can earn money. And like, people will say, well, you are only getting like $4 per pattern. So I don't know that it's worth my time to make paper patterns or distributors. So can you say again, why, or just kind of your insight about why it's a value? Yeah. So, um, when I very first decided to write patterns, um, I worked at a quilt shop um, I had worked at a quilt shop for six years and then I had worked for patterns by Annie, Annie from by Um, and so in my mindset, I, there was like printing patterns and trying to get into wholesale shops and to distributors was like the only, it was like the only thing that I thought, like that was just my mindset. Um, and as now I've been in the pattern writing for a few years, I feel like wholesale and distributor customers are probably my best customers. Um, I make more money obviously on a retail pattern, but I make way more money having my patterns and distributors. And I think my reach is broader because they reach, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of shops so that I can't <laughs> reach myself. So, um, I find getting into distributors ha- has been a really great, uh, move for my, for my person, for my pattern writing business. Um, so, um, I first wrote a pattern, my Olivia baskets pattern, and I was friends with, uh, Vanessa from Lola boutique. Um, she designs for Moda fabrics and I was like sharing with her, like, Hey, I have this basket pattern. Um, and she was like, why don't you make me samples for my booth at quilt market? And I was like, I would love to. So she gave me fabric and I made a sample for her and she had it at Quilt Market. So then Vanessa was my gateway to Moda because she was like, well, they'll want it. They'll want to pick this pattern up if you're using our fabrics. And and it was thankfully early enough because if you follow, you know, lookbooks and all of those things, everything comes out earlier than, you know, we think (laughs) way earlier than we think. So I was really grateful because they picked up my pattern and that's how I got into Moda at United Notions. Um, And I'm trying to think of the um, order in which I got into other distributors, but that was my first one. So I think building relationships with your favorite fabric designers, asking them if they need samples, that helps you with just like they may cross promote for you. Um, or fabric companies may cross promote your pattern or et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of um, great benefits, I think, to just being friends with your favorite fabric designers trying to reach out. And then sometimes they have connections to the fabric companies so that you can get advanced yardage and, um, and they might have those contacts. So I think that's beneficial because they know, they know the people at the, at the company they work for, you know? So, um, that's been really helpful for me. So that was my first distributor that I got in with my very first pattern, which I think is actually kind of a, um, a unique situation nowadays because there's so many pattern writers. I don't know that they pick you up with one pattern, (laughs) at least checker won't. (laughs) I know that much, unless you write the jelly roll rug (laughs) pattern. (laughs) So, when I tried to get into checker, I think I had three patterns at the time. And so my third pattern was my hello pouches, which is probably long game, my best selling pattern that I've written. And, um, I got connected with Vanessa Christensen from Moda Fabrics. And she was like, Oh, let me get some, let me get Moda to get you some fabric. And I was like, okay. So I made my samples out of that and I send them to her. She's like, I want them in my booth. And so she photographed them for me, which this was all at the very beginning, which was so awesome and helpful because I wasn't really into photography. Now I pay people to do my photography for me because I don't like doing it. Um, But so she um, did the photography for me and I got that pattern into Moda too. So they picked up those three patterns. And that's when I really fought to get into Checker. Um, And thankfully, Annie... Like when I worked with Annie and I had been to Quote Market, I knew the buyer at Checker. So I asked Annie, like, hey, could I have the contact? Um, and she was like, sure. So, um, and Annie CC'd me and recommended me and was really gracious that way to say, hey, pick up her patterns or whatever. And so they were like, okay, well, what are you doing to promote yourself in the community? What are your sales? What are your engagement? Like you have to really, especially with Checker, because I think Checker, 
in my opinion, is one of the best distributors to try to get into. I feel like knowing from quilt shops too, like talking to shop owners, my mom is a manager and whatever. So I have that background as well. Um, people like ordering from checker because their website's great. They have great promotions, blah, 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 all that stuff. Like they do quick shipping. A lot of other distributors are great too, but checker has been probably the premier uh, distributor that I wanted to get into at least anyways. And so you really have to sell yourself to them. And I was like, I'm teaching classes. This is my sales. You know, these are my Instagram engagement and Instagram followers, like blah, blah, blah. Like they'll ask you a lot of questions. I have a, I have a website. I have this, they'll want all of that stuff in place. And sometimes they'll say, we want, we won't look at you until you have 10 patterns or X amount of patterns. And that's not always the case, but sometimes, um, I've talked to friends recently and sometimes that's the case. Sometimes they'll just play hardball with you. So you really have to sell yourself. Um, I had chatted with, um, my friend Andy from a bright corner, um, as well when I was trying to do distributor stuff and she was like, Oh, I like to package my pattern, like print them, tie them on the ribbon, put a business card, mail them in. So then they can see the quality of my packaging, the quality of my printing, all of that, the presentation. And I think that's probably really helpful as well, which leads me to how I got into Brewer because Brewer felt like mysterious to me because I just like I hadn't had any real experience with them. Um, but they had exclusive contracts with Tula Pink and other designers. So I was like, they must be great too. So I wanted to get into Brewer. Um, and I met one of their sales reps, the Brewer sales rep. She actually took a trip to Africa with me on a humanitarian trip. I planned a sewing humanitarian trip and taught uh, some women in the village. And so she had applied to come on my team. I didn't know her, but she was a follower on Instagram and that's how she found out about the trip. So that was really that was cool. Real quick. Are you going to be doing this again? Cause that sounds amazing. And I want <laughs> in on that. <laughs> I'll let you know if I ever do. I don't know the the organizations kind of shifted different directions, but they do take like six teams over every summer. And when I, um, have babies that I feel like I could leave for two or three weeks at a time or take with me, then I would love to go back. Um, cause mothers without borders, that's the organization. It's a great, great organization. And they do some really great stuff. And they had asked me, they were like, do one more team because I was like, I want to have babies. Like I'm not taking another trip to Africa. I had taken six or five trips. And I was like, I think I'm like, I need to take a minute. And they were like, no, one more, give us one more. And I said, okay, I'll go one more. But I want to work with the women, like, let me work with the women, because I always myself planned side, side lessons to work with like two or three women that I worked with every t- trip that I took. And they were like, okay, let's do it. So it was way awesome, though. It was way awesome. We that raised so cool. for like six sewing machines and we left them with the co-op. And anyways, it was awesome. And there were some amazing people that went like Chris from my girlfriend's quilt shop, her and her daughter came and a woman named Madonna from Mad Bee's quilt shop and I think in Arizona was there. And then can I ask another question too about yeah. at the very beginning. So for people who are listening to this, they're going to be like, okay, so get in good with a fabric designer. How did you know Lella Boutique? That was like your gateway to all of this. Like, what are some tips that you have from your experience of like, if you don't know anybody, how do you get to know someone? Well, like I said, I I worked for Annie and went to trade shows and also quote market for many years. And that's how I met Vanessa. And she was living in Texas at the time. And we met in Pittsburgh at quote market. We were on the shuttle together, riding over from the, we were staying at the same hotel and her mom was there and her mom was like, oh, I'm from Santa Clara, Utah. And I was like, that's where I'm from. Well, it's like, what in the world? And, um, So we chatted, we chatted. And then I went into her booth at Quilt Market and chatted with her. I think it was her first or second collection. So she was brand new to Moda and she was darling. And I was just like, I want to be her friend. And then she ended up moving home with her mom for a short time. And, um, and she DM'd me. She just DM'd me on Instagram because I had been making bags for Annie. I'd been making Annie bags at the time. And she was like, would you make an Annie bag for me? And I was like, yes, I would love to. Um, so I did that for one of her booths. And then the next collection was when um, I started working on my own stuff. And that's when I was like, I really want to, I had already designed this basket pattern for 
Sarah Jane, which Sarah Jane um, is a Michael Miller fabric designer and lived in, she's in Provo. And she did a call out on Instagram for makers. She's like, I need people to make samples. I don't think she sews much. She never sews any of her own samples. She has people make everything for her boots. So she was like, this is kind of what I'm looking at. And she was the one that was like, I'm kind of like want a laundry basket type stuff. And I was like, could I design something for what you're wanting for your booth? And she was like, yeah. So that's when I came up with the Olivia basket design. And so I made it originally for Sarah's booth, but didn't have the pattern ready. It was just kind of a display item. And so then I took it to Vanessa and said, Hey, do you like this? And she was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And let's see if we can get you into Moda. So, um, so, so I did have that if you want to go to quilt market, if you're a pattern designer, you can get credentials and you can go to quilt market. And I think that that's a really great way to meet industry people, quilt designers, distributing companies. Like I've taken my, I took patterns to Brewer once. Um, and they get so many patterns though, from so many designers that you might get lost in the mix, but, um, but they will have a phase and, you know, it could be beneficial that way as well. Um, so I, I think I'm so happy quilt market's finally happening again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sad we missed Salt Lake because I was really excited about going, but, um, it's a really great way to meet people, quilt market. So, and quilt con, may I add, I feel like that's a really happening place. I'm sad I'm not going this year, but everybody should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been to quilt con once, but yeah, it's fun. Yeah, but like like I said, so meeting Sarah Jane was just over social media and she did a call out for that. And I was like, great, that's awesome. But you were strategic too. Like you didn't just make anything. You designed your own pattern for that. And then you wrote a pattern for that. And you strategically, I don't know if it was intentional, but you strategically used that situation very well, I think. Yeah, well, I did that with a few, I think three of my patterns I designed for Sarah Jane's fabric. Um, My second star quilt pattern was her Peter Pan line. And then the Olivia baskets was that that little basket she had asked for. And then she wanted a pencil pouch. That's my Cove clutch pattern. So every time she's like, I have this vision of this, like, do you want to find a pattern or do you want to design something? And after, after I did that first design, I was like, yeah, I'll design something. That's great. Because then there's mark extra marketing on her end. And then I have some to sell too, rather than just being paid to sew a sample of someone else's design. So yeah, it was pretty strategic. Um, But that process kind of, fell into place which was really great and I loved the years I got to work with Sarah Jane she's such a lovely person so then back to Brewer so then um so after I got back from my trip to Africa she was like send me your pattern so I sent her one of each of my patterns and then I got reached out by Brewer and they picked up my patterns they didn't pick up all my patterns but they picked up most of my back patterns which now are the ones that for me are the ones that sell the best and I'm trying to think. So there's United Notions, Checker, Brewer. Um, I did get in with a distributor in Australia. Um, I can't even remember the company anymore. But they ordered quite a few patterns at the beginning, and then I haven't heard from them in a while. But that was cool. Cool to be able to send my patterns overseas. Um, and they contacted me. I had nothing to do with that one. I don't know how they found out. I probably found out about my Hello Pouch pattern because that was the one they were the most interested in. So that was great. Um, So the most recent distributor that I am working to get in is E.E. Shank, and they're located on the West Coast, which I wanted to get them to a West Coast distributor. Um, They're in Oregon. And um, the way that happened was I went, I got invited to um, my girlfriend's quilt shop, just opened a quilt shop in Orem just a couple months ago, and they invited me to their open house and... Um, so I went and they had one of their, um, fabric salesmen there, Ron Johnson. He's, um, a salesman for EE Shank. He carries collections that distribute out of EE Shank. And I was like, Ron, how do I get into EE Shank? I'd love to get in with them. And he was like, let me get you the contact person for that. And so he has known me since I was 18 years old when I worked at Quilted Works in St. George and I even made him a quilt once he had asked me to make a quilt um for it was a line of fabric that he had woolies Maywood uh woolies 
flannel. Anyway, so he was wanted a sample to help sell the fabric to his shop. So I made that for him when I was like 20 years old. Um, so I've known him for a long time. And he was like, let me see what I can do. So he's like, give me your email address. And next thing I knew, I had the buyer's email drop into my inbox, which was so awesome. So they just barely um, accepted. They just barely um, were setting up all my product now. So it's really exciting. I really feel like there's not really one way to get into a distributor. I think that there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing it. Um, Getting shown in lookbooks is a really valuable thing because I've had people say, well, what lookbooks are you featured in? So they want to know that your stuff is being promoted by you and by others and by designers and by everyone else. They want your, you know, they want your, your pattern to sell just as much as they want it to sell. They don't want to pick up a pattern that's no one knows about, you know, because although it's great to get eyes on it, but there's, if you've ever checked out Checker's website or any distributor's website, there are so many patterns. So people aren't going to just be scouring, <laughs> scouring Checker's website to buy patterns. You know, they're, they're probably looking at the top sellers and all of those things or what they're seeing on Instagram too. So um, that, that can be a thing, you know? Um, so I'm trying to think. So yeah, so when Ruby Star first started, they did a call out on Instagram, like we're looking for people that are making paper patterns that are interested in working in promoting our fabrics. And I reached out and got connected with Devin, who was their brand manager at the time. And so that's how I got in with Ruby Star, which has been a really great connection for me um, now. Um, so I really think watching fabric companies, websites, designers, websites, when they do call outs like that, just always apply. And I think if you, for me, like I said, if they want paper patterns, give them what they want. I think that paper patterns are so valuable. And um, in really, I don't know, it really did change the pattern writing game for me. And I know people like Elizabeth said at the beginning, uh, are like, oh, but you only make like, 350 or whatever you make on a distributor pattern, $4 on a distributor pattern. I just think, yeah, but when they order, you know, 200 copies, it's like, oh, and it takes me 10 minutes to pack this up. You think about like, okay, the time versus like the pattern's done now and the time it takes me 10 minutes to pack up like a $600 order, that feels really, that feels really worth it, you know? So, um, yeah, do you guys have questions at all? Yes. <laughs> In the chat, I've been writing down all my questions so I don't forget oh. them. <laughs> Anyone else, feel free to type your questions in there. Um, do you care if I just like shoot the questions your way? Yeah, sure. Okay. Number one, <laughs> how often do you release a new pattern? Um, well, <laughs> when I, before I had babies, <laughs> I tried to do like, for a year. Um, now I just have given myself total grace. And if it inspire inspiration strikes, I write a pattern. Um, my goal this past year, 2022 was to get three patterns out. So nice. I did that <laughs> and had a baby. Well, do you see, do your past patterns still sell pretty well, or do you kind of need a new pattern to spark some more sales? Um, I would say my first and third patterns are still some of my top selling patterns. Most of my quilt patterns are not at distributor, not sold at distributors anymore. They've dropped them. And something that's interesting that I wanted to share in regards to that, um, Checker just barely sent an email. So I have a Checker account. I'm a long arm quilter. So I order my thread and everything from there. So I have an account. So I get their marketing emails. They just said, we've marked thousands of items down. Check out our clearance. So they do that. They're clearing out patterns that aren't selling as well. And so I went and scoured this, you know, <laughs> thousands, a couple thousand items because I wanted to see, oh, are they discontinuing any of my patterns? And of course, one of my quote patterns was in there, um, which I wasn't surprised because it hasn't sold great for me either. But I also saw a pattern from Then Came June, a pattern from Lo and Behold Citry, a pattern from Pen and Paper Patterns. And I just throw those out there because I'm like, okay, I'm in good company. Yeah. <laughs> like patterns don't always just keep selling, you know? And um, and so I was really grateful to see that because then I wasn't as like 
bummed out about the fact that this pattern is is maybe fading out and that's okay you know I think that that's part of our creativity as designers too like we want to create new things yeah we we can always keep the content digital content on the website and it will sell you know here and there so there's value with that but yeah so no not all of the patterns still sell but I do have a few patterns that still are really good sellers well I'm curious if you have experienced this so I have a snow globes pattern I don't sell barely any on my website, but Brewer and United Notions and Checker keep ordering like a lot of those. So they're reaching an audience that I am not privy to on my own and it's popular. So, all right. But but then there's others that I've put out that sell really well on my website that they're not ordering a ton of. So it's like a different audience. Do you notice that too? Um, I haven't noticed that a ton. But okay. um, yeah. like my front porch sells really well. Well, and better together. It's I don't have it in paper pattern. Anyhow, so some I feel like sell better with distributors than on my own. Okay, my next question: Which distributors order the most from you? I get checker orders the most. Okay, and I've been with them the long. Well, I've been with Moda the longest, but um, I was with Checker shortly after Moda. But Checker is definitely my best best customer. Same. Same. Mm-hmm. Do you email distributors whenever you have a new pattern releasing? Like, do you just reach out and say, hey, here this is, do you want to order it? Yeah, so every distributor has a different process of how they want their new pattern submitted. Um, And they're really great about um, emailing right before quote market and saying, hey, if you can get all of your new items set up by this date, and that's really great. I need to mark those dates on my calendar and maybe be a more strategic at planning my launches of when I'm releasing because you maybe you'd notice, maybe you haven't. People like some people are very strategic and they're launching all the stuff right before quote market because that's when, you know, the distributors are marketing all the new products, everything like that. Um, so I've not really jumped on that train yet. <laughs> um because I'm fly by the seat of my pants. And because pattern writing was the side hustle for me, long arm quilting has been my main bread and butter. Um, But I've just recently had a couple of patterns do really well that makes me really excited about writing more patterns. So, So now I'm starting to think, okay, like I would like to get in and release maybe a like a pattern at quilt market time so that there's extra promotion or whatever. So every distributor has a different process. Usually they just have like a form, you fill out your SKUs, your barcodes, your description, your size, sizes, all that stuff. Um, and yeah, and usually they just have a form, you can submit it and then just email them and say, yep, here's the cover images. Some distributors want copies of the covers of your patterns so that they can give them to their sales reps. So I always format that just in the process of making my cover images and I do a full cover spread that I just can send to print easily um, so that I can get those to sales reps as well. That cover, okay, I don't, I still don't understand why, but they want the back first and then the front. And I'll put an image of this in the show notes, but why is that? Is it like when they fold it, have you, do you do the same? Like it's the back and then the front? That is that funny. I've never done in the back and then the front. Really? <laughs> no, no. And they've always said, don't fold. So I've never. Yeah, I don't fold. I okay. Have no <laughs> well, and they, I feel like someone asked me that once. Maybe it send could me be a, a thing. photo of your, what you send. And I'll put a photo of what I send in the show notes and people can look at that. And then I'm curious, you said some patterns have done really well. Can you share what those are? And I'll put a link to that in the show notes because I'm curious to see, well, which which of your patterns have done really well? So my Patrick Duffel pattern that I um, released in June, I think, maybe it was May, May, June-ish. It's done really well. I did a sew along. Um, I don't know. I think because I'm a long arm quilter the people that follow me are quilters they're not really bag makers but my passion is bags I love making bags I love making quilts too I just love all the sewing (laughs) everything sewing but um so I I think turning a quilt into a bag like the Patrick bag I don't know I don't have any idea why this was a secret pattern that did well but it's been really exciting and I think it's introduced a lot of quilters to bag making which is fun um and maybe 
because I, because I'm a bag, uh, a quilter first, before I was a bag maker, you rotary cut all your pieces. There's no templates like that. Well, there are some templates and some patterns, but majority of everything is rotary cut and you bind your seams like a quilt, everything like that. So, um, that's the kind of bag making I really love. I don't love loose linings. I like everything to be quilted together. Anyway, so I don't know if that's why, but the patchwork double has been awesome. I hosted a sew along um, when my baby was two months old thinking this is perfect. I'm happier after I have a baby if I get some time to sew each week. And so this will make me carve out a little bit of time. I'll make a bag with a few people on Instagram <laughs> and yeah. ended up with 1800 people signing up for the sew along, which blew my mind. Like I was like, this is not casual. <laughs> and so I felt a lot of, there's a niche there for you that I feel like you need to really dive into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's been really fun because, because then people that have made the Patrick Duffel are like, Oh, she just released a violet, a backpack pattern. I have my violet backpack pattern. That's really fun. It's just a miniature backpack, which I think those are pretty trendy right now. People love the little backpacks and it's great for little kids, but it's great for adults. I use one as a purse when I'm not carrying my diaper bag. <laughs> um, and then I just barely released the All the Things tote, which is just a basic tote pattern. Um, it was featured in the Stitch Supply Advent calendar this mm-hmm. month, which was really a fun collaboration. And so I had that one ready to go for before my little boy was born. And I was planning on launching it. And then I had the thought, you know what? Maybe Anne would be interested in this. So I just reached out and said, hey, are you interested in this? And she was like, let me take a look. So, so I was like, oh, well, great. That gives me more time to... <laughs> to I don't have to rush to release this so um so that was really fun so I think that one will be fun because that's even a simpler bag than the patchwork duffel bag um which will be a great way to introduce new bag makers new quilters to bag making so hopefully so yeah I'm really excited about the direction that my pattern writing is going (laughs) with I'm getting excited, like, oh gosh, you've got to totally dive into that niche. And uh, my brain now is blah, 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 but that's exciting. Uh, Yeah, it's fun. It's been really fun. So what different distributor companies can you just think of off the top of your head? We've talked about E.E. Shank, Brewer, Checker, United Notions. What other ones are you aware of? Honestly, I don't, I don't know any others. There's the Australian one that I can't think of their name Mm -hmm. um, that I'm in, but haven't they haven't gotten orders for a long time but I don't know of any others I'll have to do some more research okay no that's perfect um and then I'm curious do you have an official media kit or do you sell yourself by just like listing off here's what I've done here's blah 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 um I don't have an official media kit that's a goal for next year to get one of those uh prepared but um I kind of usually just go off what their questions are they're like we're interested in knowing this X, Y, and Z. And then I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll speak to those. Cool. How many paper patterns do you order at a time? Um, it's changed over the years. I, <laughs> I was ambitious at first and would order like 500. Um, and now I don't, I don't usually order that many at the beginning of a pattern because I still have like hundreds of a couple of my patterns from their first order that I'll probably have forever (laughs) because they just haven't done as well as I anticipated or had hoped. Um, So I I usually order two or 300. Nice. And where do you print your patterns? Um, Smart Press. Oh, okay. Me too. Lots of people. (laughs) Yep. So lots of people share where they are patterns. So. I think actually Vanessa of Lella Boutique is the one who told me about Smart Press originally. So that's probably where you found out about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Eliza's wondering, she said, when you said you sent paper, or sorry, when you sent patterns to Brewer, were they paper copies or PDF? I sent paper copies. I like tried to make the presentation really nice. I wanted them to feel the bags and the paper printing and to be able to look at the way my patterns are formatted and, you know, all that. I wanted them to be able to see them. So, yeah. And then she also asks, once you are in with a distributor, what does that look like? Do they reach out when they need more patterns or are you responsible for keeping your patterns with them? No, they'll send you a purchase order when they're ready to order more. And it's, it's whenever (laughs) it depends on when they run out, when they need more. I'm sure they have a sophisticated inventory system (laughs) with (laughs) keeping track of all that. So, and then Liza has a great question. She says, 
So when, when they send you that email to place an order, the, they send like an email with like an invoice. We want this, this, this. She asks, how do you send them an invoice? Like, how does that work? And am I right, Liza? Do you want to ask that differently? Yeah, just like they send, they email you a purchase order, right? With like the quantity they're wanting and the specific patterns. And then you invoice them and then you ship them right away. Or how does that work? Yeah, so you set up terms when you get in with a distributor. Um, sometimes they want net 30 or net 60, which just means net 30 is they have 30 days to pay you. Net 60 is they have 60 days to pay you. So I I have net 30 terms with all of my distributors. So they'll send me a check within 30 days. So they don't pay you up front. Um, and I create an invoice. I just have an invoice I've made in Excel that I just fill out. And so then I have a printed invoice. I can slip in the package with them. And um, I think that, does that answer your question? Yeah. So you, would you still ship the, what they're wanting before you get the check or do you wait for the check? Oh, no, no, no. I ship everything. Okay. So you ship it right away. You send them the invoice and then they pay you within 30 days. If you have net 30 terms. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So then I'll just get a check within 30 days of um, sending my order. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. In fact, I'll put, if you want, um, I, I can do it too. I'll put a copy of my invoice. It's on a template and I just delete and, and by me, I mean, my assistant, I say, Hey, can you send them an invoice? And she'll go in and just write how many they ordered and how much they owe me. And for whatever reason, I, is this the same? So they asked for like, you need to have a logo on there your address, just some things that I was like, well, okay, it must be for tax purposes or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then Kelsey is asking, do you market directly to brick and mortar quilt shops and they direct them to the distributor or do you let the distributor market directly to the local quilt shops? So I definitely have marketed to my local quilt shops. I've gone and reached out and said, Hey, I have new patterns. I carry paper patterns. I love to teach classes so I definitely market my patterns that way to like local quilt shops. Um, and I need to have a better section on my website that's on my to-do list <laughs> as well. Um, so that wholesale customers can either like have a login on my website and order directly or whatever. But I've had lots of wholesale customers reach out through Instagram or email to order directly from me. And I think even it could be valuable to compile a wholesale email list. I haven't done any of that. But I think that um, the way that I've marketed to wholesale shops is just in my communities. So I've seen too, like some fabric designers will say, and pattern designers, if you want this, let your local quilt shop know, which I think is super smart. I need to push that more because if customers are coming in and saying, I want this. I do carry this. Then they'll, Oh, people are asking, I'll go order this. So I think that I need to push that more. Um, and, yeah, and I think it's so great to support your quilt shops too. I mean, it's like, we don't want them to leave us. We want them to stay in business. And so I love like some people are like, Oh, but we want you as a designer to have more of the cut, which I understand. And I appreciate but I honestly love supporting wholesale, my wholesale customers. I love supporting the quilt shops. I want them to stick around for a long time. And so I'm happy if we both get a piece of the pie. I, that's how I view it. I'm really, really happy to be in wholesale. Like if they take a chance on me and put my product in their shop, I'm like so happy about it. Um, and I think too, working for Annie, if you've ever followed one of Annie's Facebook lives, like every time and even just plastered on their website, it's like, if you can buy at your local quilt shop, support local, like they push that so much. And having worked for Annie, like I knew that that was like the mindset she was in. And I love that. I really love that. So that's easy. It was easy a shift for me. So I really think it's so beneficial to um, support your local quilt shops. And I offer free shipping um, for a certain amount of patterns to um, quilt shop wholesale customers because um, distributors often pay shipping. They pay for freight on patterns, depending on your agreement. They have different agreements that they'll lay out for you. So depending on what you agree when you set up uh, an account with them, so I don't pay shipping on those. So I know exactly what I'm making on them, but I've kind of done some math with my own patterns at wholesale costs. Like, Oh, at, at this many patterns, 
I can offer free shipping because I'm making a little bit more than I would even make at a distributor. So I like incentivizing the quilt shops to order from me too, because you get free shipping often on patterns from distributors. So quilt shops will be incentivized to order from distributors because you get free shipping. So they won't maybe want to order from you because they're going to pay freight, which then makes their cost into your patterns more. So that's where I've created like a threshold of like 20 patterns. If you can order 20 patterns, then I'll offer free shipping. Um, And so then if I incentivize them to order for me, so I make a little bit more money, but then they still get the free shipping, which then they can, doesn't make their costs go up, if that makes sense. I don't know. I think thinking about the wholesale customers, it's really valuable. So that's super smart. Uh, Casey's got her hand up and then Kelsey. Um, Okay. I have two questions kind of about numbers. You said that they, when you're first applying, they want to see like evidence that the pattern has sold. Well, is there like a number threshold that they would say, like, if it's sold this many copies in the last year, that's like a good indicator. And then um, the other one is, do they set your prices? Like if you're selling PDF patterns at like, say $12 or $14 or whatever, like do you need to have, like, do they say like, no, we sell them for this. So this is what you should be selling them at on your website kind of thing. Um, so I don't know the threshold. I wouldn't know, um, what the threshold of numbers of sales would be. I think that they take into a lot of different things into consideration. And now that I'm in, they don't ask me how many I've sold because I'm offering them a brand new pattern. So I don't give them any numbers like that, but, um, and no, like when I've gone in and set my prices, it's it's just I sell my pattern for $10 or $12 or whatever. And then it, based on your agreement um, at the beginning, because they have do different ranges where they'll pay different percentages for their distributor price. So then I'm just like, okay, I have an easy $10 pattern. My wholesale price is $5. Distributor price was 35% of that. That was one of my agreements. But no, you tell them what your price is. So, and they want you to sell your PDF for the same price as whatever retail price you set, you need to sell it. They'll tell you they want your PDF the same. They don't want you to sell your PDF a dollar cheaper. And people, I don't know if you've had people complain about, well, this is a paper copy and it's like, it doesn't matter. (laughs) This is the retail price of the pattern, whether it's PDF or a paper copy. Um, And that's so that you don't undercut anyone else. You don't undercut your wholesale customers. You don't undercut your distributing customers. And I think that that's really uh, an important part of that. So Awesome. And Kelsey, you have a question? Yeah. So you said with distributors, you have a net 30 or a net 60 when you are selling straight to local quilt shops. What is their turnaround time payment? Do they pay you before you ship or do you set up a contract like a net 30 with them also? No, I haven't set up net 30 with any wholesale customers. I just expect payment up front before I ship. So okay. that's a good question. And you send them an invoice just like you would the wholesale distributor? Um, I usually just send an invoice through my accounting system, just through QuickBooks. Okay. And then I'm curious if you've ever raised the price of your patterns because I'm wanting to do that. But honestly, it's the wholesale distributors that has stopped me because I'm like, Ugh, I've told them this is how much I charge. Do I then have to email them and just let them know? Like, what have you done a price raise and how does that work? So I have raised my prices from 10 to $12, but I haven't raised it on the patterns that were released at $10. So going forward, my patterns are $12. So then when I'm setting up a new item, I just moving forward, it's like, okay, yeah, now my wholesale cost on this was six and, you know, whatever. My retail cost is 12. So I haven't raised past patterns and I don't think I plan to. I'm happy getting the $10 for those patterns because those were written during that time when patterns typically were $10. So I've just raised them going forward. All right. I'm going to throw this out to the listeners. If there's anyone out there who has raised your prices on past patterns, please reach out. Let me know. I can give a little update on the podcast, how that works with distributors. (laughs) Does anyone else have questions? Okay, Eliza, go ahead. (laughs) Caitlin, I feel like you're really good at reaching out to people and getting to know people. Um, Do you think that's been the most beneficial thing for your business and getting into distributors is just reaching out? Because I feel like that's like lots of people are scared to do that for the fear of no, right? But it feels like you don't have that and it's been super beneficial for you. Yeah, for sure. I think that um, the relationships and the connections is like been everything, you know, and working for Annie and working at a quilt shop and going to trade shows and meeting designers and, 
and like meeting even friends on Instagram, like, you know, like those connections are so valuable. And I feel like that's why we're, I, I think in the broader picture, like, why are we doing any of this? Right. Is it to make money? Yeah. Obviously we want to make money. We want to support our lives and our livelihoods and our families, but I feel like it's about creating and connecting. For me, that's what it's about. So, and I think it's just a long game. I really do think it's a long game. I think it's about growing your Instagram and your social media and and growing your pattern library and all of those things. Cause I've just always been like, I know someday, someday my pattern could, my pattern writing could really be something, you know, and and I think that that's what's so fun after this year seeing that um that it has, it has been like, oh, this is like, it's made me money. My pattern writing has made me money from the beginning, but um, now it's like, okay, this I can really carve out time and pay, like really give more attention to um, because I think nowadays we're knowing like, if you want like a, what's the word, a residual income, I don't know what the word is, if someone can help me passive income. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's like, you know, money that you can make in your sleep. That's the goal, right? So you don't have to show up and, and do any of those things. It's like, yeah, that's great to be able to have a digital product. And then even paper copies, I know that's a physical product, but I don't ship a lot of paper copies to my retail customers. Um, I do more now because I'm offering hardware and and bag strapping and soft and stable all of the fixings to make the bag so I do sell more paper copies now because I'm offering more product sales on my website but before that I wasn't fulfilling orders to wholesale customer or retail customers really one every week or something you know but I was selling paper pdf patterns all the time and that requires you guys all know your pattern writers you know it requires really little attention so Awesome. And then Jess has a, her hand raised. Yes, I have just a quick question. If we don't have a ton of patterns, do you think it's worth it to go through the trouble of applying and trying to get our patterns carried by distributors? It's like, let's say, for example, you only have like maybe two, three or four. Do you think that it would be worth your time to do that? Um, well, I got picked up when I had one pattern. I think it's worth it. I think it's so, worth yeah. it. I, I got picked up when I had three patterns to another distributor. I got picked up when I had 10 patterns at another distributor. So I got think it. if you can, yeah, I think it's definitely worth it. So um, I do think it's a little bit more competitive in the industry now, but I think it's then their awareness of you, right? Um, I think that's valuable and building relationships is valuable. So those connections like we were talking about before, I just think, I think it's worth it. I think it's worth trying. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Uh -huh. And Jess, don't you have a media kit? Like, I think if you can sell yourself, which I think you can, then I don't know. I do have a media kit. Um, I wouldn't have thought to send that along. So that's really interesting. Because I know that don't they ask for certain things, certain metrics and stuff like that? Well, I think they do ask for certain things, but I think if you have something together that outli outlines all of your engagement on social media, all that stuff is really valuable too. Like they want, they don't want to pick up a pattern from somebody that's not going to do anything to promote the pattern. You know, it's like, it's like they want someone who's uh, actively showing up and trying to share their, their patterns and stuff. So that is so interesting. So Elizabeth, the media kit, man, so important. <laughs> <laughs> when I think too like this is kind of a side thing but like I think our industry is a little bit behind on influencer <laughs> influencer payments and stuff I've been reached out so many times in the last like even few months of people that want to just send me product and do something for free and I'm like no <laughs> but I don't have a media kit ready so I'm just like it's I don't have a lot of time right now either because I'm raising two babies but um but I'm like, I'm not working for free for you. <laughs> like, so I really think that as we shift our mindset of like, this is our job, this is our work, this is our platform. We've put in hours and hours and years and years of building our, our followers and building our engagement and building our communities. Like, it's not about like, okay, well, you can give me this free product if you share it in a reel, which if anyone's made a reel, they know that they don't take two minutes to do like a post. You can do a post quickly, but it's like, no, I don't, I just, I'm just like, 
realizing more and more how important it is to value our time, value what we do, value our communities, value the work that we've put in. And I know free product is awesome. And I've totally been there and I've, I love getting free stuff, (laughs) but, um, but I think that like having that, and that's like, like I said, one of my goals to put something together and do the research, but I think like the influencer marketing stuff, we think, oh, we're just quilters, but it's like, no, people are looking to us to share products and share our recommendations. And we might as well be making money on sharing other people's product. So that was a little side tangent, but I think it's important. Oh, preach. I cannot agree more. I mean, I will say at the beginning, (coughs) someone's just starting out. I do think there's value in getting seen and getting whatever, but at a certain point where obviously you are there, Caitlin, that it's not worth your time to just get free product anymore and to value that. And I don't know why in the quilting community, there is this sense of like, Oh, but no, we can just for free, just do this. It's for charity or whatever. I'm like, no, 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 this is a job. Once you start charging more, you'll start earning more. I mean, there is so much money to be had and that's being spent in this world. And we don't talk about it a lot, but there's good money to be had. You just, you got to charge and don't beg. Cause people have told me before, I can't believe you charge that much for this. Buy, then don't buy it. You know, you just don't have to buy it, but plenty of people do. And so it's clearly a value, but um, no, anyhow, don't get me started on that one. Cause I could talk, 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 but <laughs> um, and, yeah. and, and the good thing is if someone says no, that's all, that's the worst of it. They said no. It's like, okay, cool. Move on, you know? Yeah. Or you could get a nasty email from someone, but really it says more about them than you. So, you know, just let that move on. Uh, Casey, you've got your hand up. Yeah. For connecting with distributors, do you, is there like an application section on their website that you fill out or do you find like hunt for the email address, find the contact, email them your info, and then they come back and ask you for more information? I don't know if that's a thing or not because I've been in with distributors. I haven't like, I don't know. I don't know if that's a thing or not, but it's definitely worth investigating their website and getting familiar with their website probably. Um, And I shared my experience. I really have gotten into connections through connections of people that are connected to the company, fabric designers connected to the distributing companies. And I've just worked my connections to, to get the contacts that way. Um, So I wish I I had more information. Maybe Elizabeth knows more of more of that. I don't know. No, honestly, I can't say enough about just being in the room with someone, getting to know someone. It's so invaluable. So uh, you can you can blindly reach out and send an email, but they're probably getting a ton of those. So when you get the chance to go and meet somebody, just do. You know, awesome. Anyone You're- else? I did awesome. have one one other question. I'm sure it varies from pattern to pattern, but like. When you got in with Moda with that first pattern, how many did they purchase? Like to start off as a new person, they just signed on. I think usually they order 12, 12 copies. Okay. Do you know like how many you've gotten? Like there, you then said later on they ordered like 200. Like was that a different pattern or they order 12 at a time or what is your, um, I guess now? It really varies. It really varies. I don't really know how they decide, determine how many they order, but um, that particular pattern, my Olivia basket, sometimes I get 60, sometimes I get 36, sometimes I get 12. It really depends. So I think when they're reordering from me, they're looking at their numbers and looking at their sales and probably saying, oh, well, we still have this many here. And we've done, I, that's what I assume they're pr- trying to project the cells of whatever. So it varies all the time, how many patterns that they order. So you don't have a set number of like, you have to order them in sets of five or six. You just say, you, whatever you want, I'll send you. So they, when you're setting up your product, you can tell them if you have minimum, like a minimum order. I never do. I just, am like, I, I'm happy if you order one copy. I just want to be easy. Usually they never order one copy. It's usually six or 12. But um, I, yeah, I, you can do that if you want. And some people do. And I'm sure that it probably is beneficial to <laughs> sell more copies. But for my wholesale customers and my distributors, I've never set a minimum. Okay. Yeah, I worked at a quilt shop for a very short period of time. And when she purchased, she actually, I convinced her to 
get one of Elizabeth's patterns, but the distributor made her buy six at a time. So she bought like six of the lo and behold, I told her, and then six of Elizabeth's and like that. Like, so you had to buy them in quantities of six, but I didn't know if that was every distributor or if they had. That's interesting. Cause I do have a minimum of six. So I, I thought that was for the distributor. I didn't know that that w- might be for the stores. Yeah. The quilt stores can't purchase like two of a pattern. They have to purchase six. And it's like, you get six of this pattern for this amount. And they came already like rubber banded together. So I've been into Moda's distribution, like warehouse, and all of their patterns are all rubber banded, like hanging on this thing so they can just grab them off. I'm almost tempted to take away that minimum order because if a store wants to buy one, I'd be happy Hmm. All right. Thank you, Kelsey. This is very insightful. I shall be looking into it. <laughs> yeah, because I remember unloading that when we got a whole bunch of new patterns and they were all like rubber banded in sex of, sets of six. Um, and that's how they priced them out. And that was, I think that was Brewer that she ordered from. I think that Brewer was like her only, Brewer, Brewer and Moda, I think were the only two that she ordered from. So it could depend on the distributor because I know like Checker, I've ordered like, for instance, Wonder Clips to sell on my website and those come in a box of three. So when I order Wonder Clips, they're going to get, I'm going to get three packages no matter what, you know, if I order one quantity equals three packages in a box. So it depends on the product, the item, whatever, but I'm sure that I wonder if that is connected to this, like say Elizabeth's minimum was six, maybe that's connected. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Because yeah, lo and behold's was like that too. Brittany's was like that too. It came bundled in a little pack of six. Um, and she had a few other patterns that she got that they all had to come in six. So I don't know. It might be the distributor. Um, Cause I know she also ordered like the sew line glue stick refill. She had to like, if she ordered one unit, it actually came with like 10 refill packages. So I think they do it like that. Well, I had reached out when I first opened in a, a wholesale distribution account. There were all these things I didn't understand. Like, what's this? What, what's this? You know, what's your minimum? And so I reached out to people like, what, what should my minimum be? And everyone just said, I do six. So I was like, well, okay, six, you know? So I don't even, I guess I should consider <laughs> that. So anyhow, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause when my mom and I went to Moda and we were walking through my mom prior to me having a business has had a business for quite a while. Um, but even for her, she couldn't just go buy one pattern if she wanted, like they came in packs of six or when she purchased glue stick refills, it came in a pack of 10, um, like bolts, you can buy one at a time because those are large items, but like books, I think you had to buy three or four at a time. Like there were a minimum quantity. And even like with art gallery, like if you buy a fat quarter bundle, it comes with four. You can't just buy one fat quarter bundle wholesale. So I sell wholesale, but there's no login or anything like that. I don't ask for credentials. I, if you buy five patterns at a time, you can get the wholesale price. Cause honestly, someone's going to buy five patterns. I don't care if they're what, you know, whatever you can buy it at the wholesale price. I don't know if I'm shooting myself in the foot, but do you guys have that set up on your websites where you sell wholesale right on your website? So I don't, I don't have that. I want to, I want to do something like that. I think Emily Dennis does. And I think I was checking out Emily's website and I was like, oh, this is so cool that her mm-hmm. customers can put in a wet, a, like an order straight from her website, you know? And she has so many great patterns that I was like, yeah, that's mm-hmm. such a cool idea. So um, that was what gave me the idea to do that. But I don't, I just, I just say, I don't even know if I have a spot that says email me. <laughs> so I think I would like to start speaking more to my wholesale customers that way. But, um, but just for reference, I don't think every pattern is a minimum of three or six because I've ordered patterns on checker and I've gotten one pattern. So, oh, really? oh yeah. Yeah. Plenty of times. So I don't, I don't know if it's certain distributors that do that, but I guess for checker, I can speak to checker. I've ordered one pattern off of checker plenty of times. So I do have wholesale patterns listed on mine, the couple that I have printed and that's how I've sold all of my paper patterns up until now. Cause I haven't been in with a distributor. And I think um, the reason I got it set up is because I had someone reach out to me that she wanted to do one of my patterns in a guild. And I was like, I don't have paper patterns. And so I figured out how to get them printed. And that's, I haven't sold a ton. I think I've maybe sold like 
30 or 40, 50 or something like that. So not like a huge amount, but that's how I've done it. Nice. And how do you, do you just have like, if people buy a certain amount, it's at this price or do you have like, they have to have credentials or. No, I just have them in bundles of five. Um, and that's how they can purchase them. Yeah. I'm the same I don't thing. sell them. Yeah. I don't sell like paper patterns individually just because like with shipping and stuff, it's by that point, it's, I don't know. So the only paper patterns I offer are in bundles of five or 10. And Jess, you sell them. Um on your website I, I used to just have like an, a product listing and it was like you know this is wholesale it's in minimums of five like you have to have five um but I found most people just reached out by email most people didn't even use that they just were like hey I'm a quilt shop out of Spokane I want to buy 10 patterns awesome well thank you Caitlin for coming and speaking. Thank you so much for being here. This was super insightful. And thank you, Casey, Liza, Jess, and Kelsey for coming to ask your questions as well. Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. And again, thank you for being flexible to go with the flow and record our conversation and have it shared here on the podcast. For those of you who want to see photos of our pattern covers, you know, the a one page with the back and backing that we include, and if you want to see the other things that we talked about in the podcast, visit the show notes at quilterscandy.com forward slash 88, and there's a link where you can get a download of all of those things. And if you haven't seen Caitlin's Instagram account with her patterns and all of the beautiful things that she has created, be sure to visit Knot and Thread on Instagram. And if you are enjoying the podcast, make sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Take a screenshot of your review and send me a DM. That way you are eligible to get the Craft a Career Club for free, 100% for free in January of 2023. So I will be back here next Friday with a brand new podcast episode. I hope you are all having a lovely holiday season. Have a great week and I will see you here Friday.